Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Congressman Adam Smith was the youngest state senator in the country when elected to his first term at age 25 in Washington state. Since January 1997, he has been a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Washington's 9th District. He received a whopping 71% of the vote when re-elected in 2022. He's also the top Democrat on the House Armed Services Committee. But Congressman Smith is more than a political figure. He has seen his fair share of pain, three hip surgeries, a collapsed lung, a liver ailment, chronic pain, anxiety, and depression are cocktail enough for putting a strain on anyone's mental health. But also factor in that his friend and colleague, Gabby Giffords, who he traveled with to conflict zones, survived an act of domestic terrorism when she was shot in the head at a public event in Arizona. He also learned at age 26 that he was adopted. In a remarkable step of courage and inspiration, Congressman Smith became an author. His book, Lost and Broken, My Journey Back from Chronic Pain and Crippling Anxiety, advocates for those who have struggled with mental health issues. I'm pleased and honored to welcome my guest, Congressman Adam Smith. Good morning. Thank you very much for uh, having me on. Wow. Where to begin? <laughs> How about the beginning? When did you know you wanted to serve in government? Gosh, you know, when I was really young, my father, he was in a union. He was a ramp serviceman for United Airlines, <clears throat> but he was in a machinist union. He was the secretary treasurer. So he would get involved involved in some local political stuff. And so he wanted me to be involved. So I started going to campaign meetings, gosh, when I was probably 12, 13 years old. And I always had an interest in it. You know, I don't know that I knew for sure that's what I wanted to do, but I definitely had an interest in politics from a very young age. And then I slowly got involved in my community. I lived in the same place for the first, well, to some degree, I've lived in the same place my, my entire life. But I uh, grew up uh, in the SeaTac area, south of Seattle. And I got a pretty strong connection to the community. So I liked politics. I liked solving problems. I liked the community. It seemed like something I would be interested in. And then events just sort of created the opportunity that I chose to seize at a fairly young age. I can't even imagine. You learned you were adopted one year after your first term in office. Why then? And why were you not told sooner? Yeah, I think, well, why then is because my adoptive parents, my, my father passed away when I was 19, and then my mother died. She died actually the night before I was elected to the state Senate when I was 25. So it was about six months after that, that I got a letter from my biological mother. So the why then is because my, my parents had passed away. Um, why they didn't tell me, I think would be, well, hard to answer, but my guess um, is that no time ever seems right. And my parents were not great at confronting difficult problems. I think I can say that without it being too judgmental. And I think it just, it just always seemed too difficult. And then, you know, I'm too two, three, four, five, 10, 12, you know, and they just decided never, never to confront the issue. So yeah, I mean, it certainly created some challenges. Did you have any hint when you were growing up? Did you feel like you were being treated just, you know, a little off or a little differently? Uh, I had no hint whatsoever, um, which is funny because all of my friends, I mean, I have two brothers um, who were the biological children of both of my parents. And we're not even remotely alike um, in a variety of, of different ways. So to a lot of my friends who are like, yeah, of course. But as a child, you accept the world that is presented to you. But it's like, 
this is what, what reality is. And you, you, know, you don't really focus on those sorts of things. So there were plenty of hints to answer your question. I perceived none of them at, <laughs> at, at that age. Do we ever? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's. And you were already experiencing anxiety, stress and depression, but as a public figure, especially in such a polarized profession, how on earth did you manage this before seeking help? Yeah, well, there's two parts. I mean, first of all, I was always a high stress person. I was insecure as a child, which I outline in my book, shy, introverted, scared of a lot of things, sort of prone to worrying a lot. But there's a difference between that and a debilitating level of depression or anxiety. I basically had three bouts of that when I was 25, right before I discovered that I was adopted, and right after I was elected, I had like a four month bout of deep depression. And if you've never actually had depression or anxiety, it can sometimes be hard because it's like, well, yeah, I was really down for a week or yeah, I, I was stressed. That's not what this is. <clears throat> depression and anxiety is a level of either depression or being really, really stressed out that A, you, you can't really point to any one specific cause. It's not like something happened. It's stuff that has always been there. It's things that you don't understand and it's deep, pervasive, and doesn't go away. So for most of my life, I didn't have that level of anxiety and stress. So to some degree, the fact that I was a worrier and stressed motivated me to work hard. Now, the being shy and terrified part, that was something I had to overcome. And that just took a, a desire, really. I was, you know, I was ambitious. I wanted to accomplish things. I would avoid anything that would sort of make me stressed out or fearful. I would spend a lot of time by myself just so I didn't have to stress about the world around me. But if there was something that I wanted and the choice was between confronting my fears and failing, most of the time in those rare circumstances, I would choose confronting my fears. Mm -hmm. And then once the anxiety hit later in life, uh, when I was 40 the first time and then eight years after that, I struggled. I, I, I survived. I, I moved forward as best as I could. And as I outlined in the book, desperately tried to find help, but it was really hard. Yeah. And because you were going through a lot of pain, I mean, the cocktail of injuries that you have mentioned and how much of the chronic pain is related to anxiety or does the anxiety compound the chronic pain? Yeah, it's hard. And, and I always, I really emphasize in my book that the story I'm telling is, it's sort of a guidepost. Here's what I experienced, both in terms of pain and anxiety, and some of the treatments that I sought, and some of the advice that I got, some that was good, some that was bad. And I hope that people suffering similarly can look at that and, and learn a little bit. But no two situations are ever the same. You know, there's a lot of times when anxiety or depression are the 100% cause of your pain absolutely happens that that's the way your brain works that was not the case for me i had you know knee surgery when i was like 16 years old that i didn't properly rehab from an injury and so my body got out of whack and from gosh the time i was like 19 or 20 i had knee pain back pain hip pain manageable there'd be times when my back would be just killing me for a month at a time but i'd, I'd get my way through it so that certainly contributed to it. In the end, as I finally, I found a psychologist who helped me. I did three and a half years worth of psychotherapy to really understand what the sources of my anxiety and trauma were. And I found a muscle activation therapist who got my body working again. It is my belief that they were two separate things. They certainly fed off of each other. The pain uh, caused a lot of anxiety, not knowing what was wrong with me. And I'm sure the anxiety contributed to the pain in some ways, but I really had two distinct problems that I needed to tackle. Now, like I said, sometimes they will be more intermixed than others. You know, you need to find good therapists, good physical therapists, as well as mental health ther therapists to sort of sift through that. The answers, the answers rarely are like, boom, obvious. You know, to figure out how your body works and how your mind works, it, it takes some effort and some trial and error.
And I'm sure it did not help that you clocked in five hours each way flying back and forth from Washington <laughs> State to D.C. as that's going to play a real toll on an aching, already aching body. <laughs> yeah, no, and it stressed me out. I mean, it's funny. One of the many great reliefs I have now, I'm still flying back and forth, but you know, and so my flight's usually about eight o'clock in the morning. I get up at four o'clock in the morning because I've got an exercise routine that I like to do before I take the flight. But now every day I'm fine because I remember those days. I remember leading up to it like, I got to get up at five. Yeah, I get, yeah, I can take this flight. Am I going to make it? The pain is terrible. I remember just being stressed out beyond belief. I got to get on that plane. I got to get back there. And then I got to turn around and come home. And it was blah, stressful in the extreme. So now that it's not, it's a tremendous relief. But yes, that that definitely was was a difficulty. And I guess it's no surprise that your body said, ah, oh, no, let's not do this anymore. And shut down just with a November election looming. And there was just as if there wasn't enough stress in your life. But seeking help as a public figure, isn't that kind of terrifying? Yeah, no, I think, and this is one of the big points of, of my book is, you know, getting the help in the first place is is difficult, particularly on the mental health side. Now, I think it's difficult on the phys physical health side because our healthcare system tends not to be great at diagnosing problems. And I know a lot of people who can get frustrated. It's like, I'm in pain. You go to a physical therapist, you go to a doctor, you know, they tell you something and it doesn't doesn't work. So, I mean, figuring out how your body works can be difficult. But on the mental health side, you've got a couple of things battling. Number one, you've got a stigma. You know, if people think you have mental health problems, they view you differently than if they think you've got a bad back. Okay. It is stigmatized. And I've described it in, in interviews. And I can't remember if I am this explicit about it. Yeah. And in, in my book, I am explicit about it too. My view of mental health growing up was there was this line. And on one side of it was normal, and on the other side of it was crazy. And I was normal, so I didn't have to worry about mental health, <laughs> okay? And I, I think, and a lot of people do think of it that way. If you cross over that line and say, I have a mental health problem, oh my goodness, now it's like, I got to worry about this. People are going to look at me. So there's an incredibly powerful desire to wish it away, <laughs> okay? And that's what, you know, when I was 25 and I had that bout of depression, I didn't talk, I didn't tell anybody about it. I didn't do anything about it. And after four or five months, it went away. So I was like, I guess this is the way mental health works. So have a few problems, ignore it, eventually it goes away. So it's very, very difficult. And then, yes, as a public figure, if people you know perceived me differently, I mean, we all want to sort of manage our brand, our image, you know, and part of that image, you don't want it to be that you've got a mental health problem if people are, you know, going to vote for you and depend on you to be a leader in the community. That's the perception. And the final thing that makes it difficult is the general perception out there that, okay, I have a mental health problem. What's anybody going to do about it? And that was part of my thing. It's like, I knew enough about physical injuries. So like my knee hurts. I come in and they diagnose it and they say, you need a surgery. You don't need a surgery. And then they have a physical therapy program. Do these exercises, do these stretches, do that thing, you get better. What are they going to do to, to change the way I feel? What's anyone going to tell me that's going to make my mind suddenly go, oh no, it's fine. All right. You know, I just, I had no conception of it. And I think most people don't, but the truth is there are some very specific mental health therapies that can help you train your brain in the exact same way you train your body. I've taken the saying that it's like, let's say that you're easily winded, your cardio is not great. So you're like, okay, I'm going to go run. I'm going to bike. I'm going to swim. There's ways to build up your cardiovascular strength so you can climb up more hills and not be out of breath. Same is true for your brain. You know, you can train your brain to better process the events in your life so that they are less stressful and less troubling, both in terms of the now and then in terms of dealing with stuff in the past that could be causing you underlying problems for reasons that you're not immediately aware of. And of course, there is no one size fits all for the treatment of mental health. Doctors love to prescribe drug therapy. And sometimes those medications like Prozac um, could be worse than the actual symptoms. Absolutely. How hard was it for you to find that right cocktail? Because I'm sure it didn't happen overnight. 
Yeah, no, it was brutally difficult. I saw probably, probably about a dozen different psychologists or psychiatrists. I took a variety of different medications. And my top line belief is this. First of all, we way over prescribe medication and it leads to complications and difficulties and also frequently will mask the problem. And let me explain what I mean by that before getting into the drug piece of it. What I come to understand about mental health is there's several layers to it. A lot of times therapists want to start with cognitive behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy is really important. What that basically means is, you know, when you go through cognitive behavioral therapy, they'll sit you down and they'll say, okay, what are you anxious about? What's making you depressed? And they have you think through it. Okay. And this is helpful because a lot of times you get these emotions, uh, you know, you're freaked out and you're like, you don't even think about, so no, let's, let's chill for a moment. What's really going on? And to have that conversation and walk through those specific things, how you feel about a job, a relationship, a healthcare problem. And then once you've identified what you're anxious or depressed about, then you sort of talk through strategies for how to better understand it. You know, number one, are you exaggerating it? Catastrophizing they call it, uh, which a lot of people do. I catastrophized. I think we all kind of naturally do that. You see one small thing and you're like, oh my gosh, this means my life is over. This means my wife's going to leave me. This, and it, it, Okay, let's see what's really going on here. And then second or third, what are strategies that could help you deal with that stress? Okay, you know, you're, you're feeling overworked. The job isn't going well. Could you talk to your boss? Could you talk to a coworker? Maybe there's something else you'd like to do with your life. All that, that's, that's fine. But before you get to cognitive behavioral therapy, there are two baseline things that you have to think about. Number one, which is hard to understand, but you have to have an essential belief in your own self-worth, okay? That you are, to use the Buddhist phrase, worthy of love. And if you don't believe that, if you haven't gotten that basic nurturing from childhood that tells you that you are worth, you have self-worth just because, not because you're smart or good or whatever, just because you're human. Because if you don't believe that, what you're doing every single day, what I was doing is you're trying to prove it, okay? You don't know if you have self-worth or not. So you're trying to show people one way or the other that you're smart, you're good, you're talented, you're capable, whatever. And that is really going to drive you crazy because you nobody's perfect. You're going to make mistakes. And if you view those mistakes as an existential statement on your essential self-worth, you're in trouble. And that's what my psychotherapy really did for me was establish that basic self-worth, which I didn't have because of a problematic childhood and a whole bunch of different things. And I thought, you know, I had self-worth because I was a good husband. I was a good father. I was good at my job. Hmm. And then the final thing on this is any trauma that you've experienced at any point in your life that you have not properly dealt with haven't properly dealt with it, that underlying issue. And if you don't deal with your self-worth, if you don't deal with previous trauma, cognitive behavioral therapy really isn't going to be that helpful because the answer to the question, what is making me anxious is, I don't know. We're going to need to go deeper. Sorry, that's a long answer, but that's the no, basis that's, of what I learned. Yeah. I think it's kind of an epidemic that people feel that way. So 100%. maybe everybody needs therapy. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't go that far. I think everybody needs to understand the essentials of their mental health. Have a decent sense of self-worth. Be honest with yourself about trauma. And by the way, trauma doesn't have to be extreme, okay? In my case, it wasn't so extreme as it was just, I was really upset about the way my family had fallen apart of the family that I grew up with. And I never dealt with it. Okay. A lot of times trauma can be extreme. If you've been abused or you've been passed from one foster home to another, grew up with an alcoholic or drug addicted parent, and that stuff you really do need to deal with. And by the way, there's a ton of new therapies out there that in some cases they focus on, okay, re-experience the trauma and deal with it. Other cases, there's ways to sort of rewire the way your brain looks at that trauma, which can be really, really helpful. To, to get you, you know, back to a sort of stable center. But you're absolutely right. It's, it's going to depend on each person, but it doesn't necessarily require a therapist, depending on what you're going through. And is recovery even a thing? I mean, do you all of a sudden wake up one morning? Oh, I'm cured. I don't need meds or therapy anymore. 
<laughs> See, those are two different questions. And the answer is recovery is absolutely a thing. Okay. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And second, no, it very rarely happens that it's like that, you know, rose, rosebud moment, if you will. Sorry, that's a reference to Citizen Kane. But, <laughs> you know, where you're like, oh, that's it. That's why I felt that way. It usually takes a little bit of time. It certainly took time in, in my case um, to, to figure out what, what's going on. But the big point on this Recovery is absolutely a thing. And this is one of my biggest worries about how we're looking at mental health, certainly in the United States right now. We spend a lot of time focusing on the stigma, and rightly so, as we discussed. People do feel stigmatized. They need to be more open about it. But once you're more open about it, the objective of being more open about it can't be to have just sort of a voyeuristic, oh, my God, look how screwed up that person is, you know, but to get better. To build resilience, which is absolutely possible. I, I don't see a therapist anymore. You know, it was eh, like three and a half years. Um, I had to work through some things. And now I do some basic meditation. I do my own cognitive behavioral therapy, thinking through things. Um, you can absolutely get cured. I, I don't want mental health to be thought of as, oh, I've got a debilitating thing. So now I'm debilitated for the rest of my life and I'm just going to sit around and talk about it. No, there are actual ways to get better, build resilience, and get to more peace in your mind. And even in Canada, most mental health treatment is out of pocket. And that makes it very difficult for a lot of people to seek help. So what do you think gauges this physical pain as being more acceptable than mental health and and will our um, governments ever make this change i know you're trying but i'm i mean yeah do you see change in the future I think we're getting better. The stigma's going down. I think the reason physical health is more acceptable than mental health is we understand it better. We still don't understand it that well. But like I said, if somebody says to you, you know, I broke my leg skiing, there's no part of you who goes, okay, well, what does that mean exactly? No, nah, we all know what that is. Okay. The recovery can vary depending on what happens, but it's something that people are familiar with. If somebody says to you, I have uncontrollable anxiety. Okay. Why? I mean, the initial reaction is, okay, well, what are you worried about? Okay. Well, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, it's obviously not doing you any good. So I think it is that it is sort of the mystery of not understanding how the brain works. And we're beginning to be more public with that. And that's good. Now you raise a different issue and that is, okay, how do we afford the healthcare that we need for people? And I'll let you in on a little secret. We can't, yeah. okay? You know, there is no society in the history of the world to date who has ever figured out how to pay for all the health care that people need, much less all the health care that they want. It's just the nature of the world. So what you have to do is you have to figure out how to manage that in the most reasonable way possible. Look for ways to deliver care more cost effectively. Look for what you're spending money on that you shouldn't be spending money on. And I'm glad you made that point about Canada because in my country, I'm a Democrat. So my party tends to say, oh, you know, if, if only we had a healthcare system like Canada or Great Britain, we wouldn't have these problems. I'm like, hmm, they, they, they'd probably be better. Okay, we have a very wild, wild west ad hoc sort of system where you never know what's covered and what's not. And that makes it very difficult. But even if you had a single payer or universal system, that system can't afford. Let, let's say everyone shows up and says, hey, I need to see a therapist five days a week for an hour. You yeah. can't pay for that, you know, for 330 million people. Are you kidding me? Not enough money in the world, not enough therapists in the world for that matter. So you're always going to have to manage that aspect of it and try to make sure that we deliver the health care that is most needed in the most cost-effective way possible. That's really a good point because that is something that comes up even up here in Canada. Uh, I mean, it's a blessing, I must say. I mean, I can go to the hospital and not pay out of pocket for anything. 
Um, but and you can and you know that you can go if something and I happens. I know that I like, can go. Yeah. Right. You're not like going. Oh, is this provider covered by my insurance? Yeah, okay, which I can't even imagine that. Right? Especially when you're yeah. sick already. Oh, I mean, yeah. Right. You're you're not thinking clearly by definition. We have waiting waiting times, but really, in essence, it's a blessing. But yes, you're right. You can afford to cover everything. So even if you, I think that I've never had a baby, but I think that people who have kids up here have to pay a little bit about out of pocket same for some cancer meds and of course we have to pay for prescriptions and you know so it isn't completely 100 percent covered and but that is a good point that you raised and i thank you for that because i don't think you hear that enough that there isn't a one size fits all for every population and yes you guys have way more people so to have the single pair it might be it might be very difficult so given that in different community i mean whether you're in a city like we are or whether you're in a very small town depending on what state or province where would you start? I guess you could Google search, but where would you determine somebody should might start if they're having those thoughts that you had, those triggers that you had? Yeah, um, I think there's a couple places to start. And I hesitate to, to say this because, well, you can go online. You can do your own research. You can. Now, you have to be discerning and how you do that research, as I discovered. There's a lot of stuff puked out there online that isn't necessarily helpful. But if you want to get sort of the basics of what might be going on, I would urge people when they're first dealing with this problem to do some research on their own. Okay, what is anxiety? What is isn't is depression? What are the possible causes? I think, and I didn't do this when I when I first you know started experiencing these symptoms. I sought out a psychiatrist and went through it. I think it would be really important to get that baseline understanding up front. And then, particularly if you have deep anxiety and depression, uh, clinical, not just you're high stressed or you're feeling down for a while, you should try and find a therapist. And I will say that there's a shortage of them, but even in my community, I spent a lot of time working on behavioral health issues. There are a lot of nonprofits, a lot of people who will see you, even if you can't afford it, just as an initial matter. Typically, that's people who are covered by by Medicaid. But I think you should, in that situation, try and seek out a therapist. One of the things we really need to do in this country is improve the number of basic sort of social workers that we need. I have a bias against psychiatrists. Basically, you know, the psychiatrist I saw never really helped me. I think some of the best therapists were people who were a little lower on the educational level there, who had a more fundamental, straightforward understanding. And also in America, people People want to see psychiatrists primarily for one reason. They're doctors. They can prescribe meds. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and as I've outlined earlier, that's not necessarily the answer, but do some of your own research, figure out what the parameters are of what you're dealing with. And also if you have a, a friend or a family member or somebody close by, um, because as you mentioned, when you're feeling this way, it can be hard to think logically and rationally, you know, confi confide in some, confide in people who are close to you. Um, that too can be really helpful, um, you know, before you have to necessarily find a, a, you know, mental health provider. I think all of those things can help you, but yes, try to find a therapist who can help guide you forward from that point. What is the one takeaway you want people to know when they read your book? Yeah. The two words I always use are help exists. That is the number one biggest takeaway that I want people to have. Um, and, you know, it's just sort of my personality. I always tell my staff, if, you, if you're going to bring me problems, bring me solutions as well. We can all sit around and lament how terrible this is or how terrible that is. But in any given situation, there are things you can do to make it better and there are things you can do to make it worse. This is uh, the analogy I use in my book to the princess bride at the end of the movie where it's, you know, what, what are my liabilities? What are my assets? You're going to have things going for you. You're going to have positive options. And both when it comes to chronic pain and when it comes to mental health, 
you can find things that will help you get better. Now, I'm not naive and I'm not going to be Pollyannish here, um, not necessarily going to make you perfect. All right. But there will always be things that can make you better. I also acknowledge that there are certainly problems that were far more severe than the ones that I faced. But you've got to believe that you can get better and go approach it from that problem solving mentality. You know, what can I do to get help? And again, I've outlined the mental health piece in terms of how you think through it. And you got to deal with that underlying sense of self-worth. you got to deal with whatever trauma in your life you may have not properly dealt with. And then, yes, do cognitive behavioral therapy to figure out how to better process the stresses that exist in your life. On the physical health side, my one great you know insight is muscle activation matters, mm -hmm. matters enormously. And most physical therapists are unaware of that fact. They're focused on strength. They're focused on flexibility. But the way our muscles work, they, they, they have a very specific pattern that they're supposed to work in, okay? And all manner of different things will happen that will push them out of that pattern. In my case, it was that, that knee surgery I had that had me relying on the left side of my body more than the right. I also had impinged hips, you know, from that's a genetic thing. And all of that forces your muscles to work in ways that they're not designed. And if you do that, they will literally shut down so that they're not firing. OK, you go to make a movement where this muscle should kick in and propel your body. And it's just sort of limply pulling you in that direction. If you go to muscle activation, people, and they get those muscles started again, once your muscles are actually working, they can cover up all manner of problems. I mean, torn labrums, arthritic knees, impinged hips, all kinds of different things suddenly aren't painful if your muscles are moving you forward like they're supposed to. So muscle activation and then the basics of mental health, I think, are good first steps to getting to that help exists point. Congressman Smith, thank you so much for coming on my show. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity. So Thank you. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.